Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and you're listening to the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk about actionable stock ideas, timeless investing concepts, and the overall way that we think about investing at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Go to focuscompounding.com and enter in your email to get a free watch list from Jeff every other week. And be sure to check out all of our other work where Jeff writes about stocks at focuscompounding.com. I upload how-to investing videos on YouTube, and we both manage capital for investors at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe to follow along. Hello. How's it going? <laughs> My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding. Thanks so much for tuning in with myself, sitting alongside Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? We, it is, uh, it's going great. I hope it's going great. I mean, I, I hope it is, because we're in New York right now, so I hope the trip is going great for mm -hmm. us. November 11th through the 15th, if you're interested in meeting up with Jeff and myself to talk about stocks or potentially becoming an investor in our firm... Uh, whether through the fund or the managed accounts, reach out to invest at focuscompounding.com. If you want to get more information on that uh, prior to doing that, go to focuscompounding.com and click that invest with us button. You'll see the presentation that we put out. Um, if you're not following me on Twitter, you definitely should be at Focus Compound. Twitter saw the presentation first, and I think they see everything first because that's where I tweet everything out. So definitely check out uh, my Twitter. Again, that is at Focus Compound. And if you want to uh, get on the list to meet up with Jeff and myself, email invest at focuscompounding.com. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about the process of selling a stock to buy another stock, okay. which could be a very hard process, I think, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, buying, uh, buying a company, I think a lot of people have put more thought into buying um, a company or buying a stock mm -hmm. instead of selling a stock, if okay. that makes sense. And I don't know if it's something that deserves an equal amount of thought process. Maybe it does. I think the way that we do it probably simplifies it mm -hmm. and, um, you know, takes sort of biases and I guess just thinking overthinking things out of it. For example, we, you know, just constantly ranking our portfolio to the stock that we like the best based on, you know, its prospects and where it's currently trading. Um, you know, and then if we uh, like a stock better on our watch list, then we'll just replace it with a stock that maybe is at number five or number six on the portfolio, depending on how many stocks we're holding in the portfolio. And mm -hmm. when we decide to sell, we typically sell all at once. And when we decide to buy, we typically buy all at once, mm -hmm. right? But the process of selling to buy another stock, I mean, we could talk about it even from a money management perspective, but let's more so talk about it um, from the individual's perspective okay. to make it practical for everybody listening. So I guess what are your thoughts on um, you know, selling stock to buy another stock? And how do you get to that point where you're like, okay, I'm going to sell this position to buy another stock and feel, I guess, comfortable doing it? Because it could be hard sometimes if you're looking at the company constantly that you just sold. Right. You're like, oh, wow, now it's going up. What did, mm -hmm. what did I do wrong? You know? Yeah. Yeah, so for me, it's uh, it's always driven by the buying. So it's always replacing something. Uh, if we were going to sell something just to sell it, it would be because we made a mistake. And then we would do that regardless of whether we had another stock to replace it with immediately or not. So if we got really worried about the riskiness of the business, we had misjudged it or something like that. Um, but when we uh, sell a stock, normally it's to replace it with another one. So it's driven by the stock that we want to buy. Uh, the, the thing that I think is difficult for people about it is they want to probably uh, sell a stock that has made them a profit, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they want to sell this. So one stock that they own goes up 50% or something, and then a stock that they've been looking at but haven't bought goes down 50%, and they think, I'll sell the thing that's up 50% and buy the thing that's down 50%. And that can be fine in so far as you're buying some, if you buy sell something that's more expensive to buy something that's less expensive, that's good. But to do it because you want to take that profit is uh, a problem and something I see a lot. Uh, so the biggest caution that I have is always to try to make sure that you're upgrading um, your the actual business in terms of either the safety of the business or the quality or something that you're switching from something that you'd rather own. Imagine you'd have to own it like forever. You're switching from something that you don't like less at least. So you don't want to switch from something that you liked more to something you like less, except it's cheaper. Um, yes, buying cheaper is always a good thing. So selling something expensive to buy something cheaper is good, but I'd be very cautious about doing it if it moves you into a business you think is inferior. Mm -hmm. And you know what the hard part is, I think, of when you sell out a position to buy another 
stock is okay so let's go from the process you bought a company that you thought was undervalued right the way that we invest maybe it's overlooked mm -hmm. let's say everything goes well the stock goes up yeah um you know it's not as cheap anymore maybe it's less of an overlooked stock now okay. so let's say it's continuing to go up there's a lot of attention to it right because we bought it when it's undervalued and now it's maybe fairly valued mm -hmm. more people know about it okay um and then you're you're selling that position and then rotating it into a company that is again kind of back to square one right undervalued probably overlooked mm. not moving around much for example so i think it could be kind of hard from a psychological perspective right. to see company a that is more maybe fairly valued but less overlooked okay i guess move around more yeah into a company that is your it's an undervalued company so now you're starting that whole process over again of okay well um you know it could take the market a couple of years to figure sure. it out, for example, because it's an undervalued company as opposed to the company A that's not undervalued, it's more known now. You know, so how do you deal with, I guess, those sort of nuances in the price movements of stocks in general? Yeah, I mean, I don't really focus on the price movements, so I'm thinking in terms of always calculating what I think the expected return from this stock would be if we held it for like 10 years. So I'm happy that we're switching in that kind of situation. We're switching out something that has a lower expected return over the next 10 years to something that has a higher expected return. But you're absolutely right in terms of things like momentum, where if you're selling a stock that's been performing well, it's likely to keep performing well, probably. Because, I mean, the best thing to do is buy a company when it's overlooked and illiquid and sell it when it becomes, you know, more liquid and less overlooked. Right. And it and it's most likely will overshoot, you know, it, just as it was cheap when you bought it, was uh, uh, the stock price was a lot lower than what you thought it was worth. It's like that the stock price will eventually go above what you think it's worth. Oh, yeah, and especially yeah. the way that, I guess, we invest, right? If you're saying, mm -hmm. think, uh, you know, general rule of thumb of 13 times earnings, I mean, right. even if it goes to a market multiple, you know, that's still, I don't want to say cheap, but you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, it could continue to go up as well. Yeah, and people will be surprised that stocks that you bought at 10 times earnings do sometimes go to 30 times earnings or more. And you, when you buy it, you never think that that will happen. You don't think the market will revalue it that much, but it actually will. If you're right about the business being really high quality, but you bought it at 10 times earnings, uh, the market will eventually decide that it is very high quality once it's been you know, um, I mean, when, if the business is performing well and then the stock performance is strong too, it starts to attract a lot of attention. Totally. Yeah, yeah. When those two things are both happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, how do you, I guess, guard against, is it really just focusing on the perspective of what will this look like? What return do I conservatively think we can get if we held this from 10 years? Yes. Do you think that really helps guard right. against the bias? Yeah. I don't think that you can, uh, what we do now, traders might be different, but what we do, I don't think you can think this stock that I'm switching out of in uh, will do worse than the stock I'm buying over the next year. Mm -hmm. I just don't think you can predict. Yeah, that. and and I think every investor listening, I think their edge lies in the ability to think in terms of you know three, four, five, ten years what the company mm -hmm. could look like as opposed to next quarter, right? And because that's what the whole market obviously looks at is next quarter. And it was like, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's. I think that is a good edge for everybody listening. Yeah. yeah, and a big warning that I should give is that I think, although many people think they'll sell a stock and they'll buy it back at some point, in my experience, that's a lot rarer than people think. Uh, people who decide to sell a stock, that's usually going to be the end of their relationship with that stock. Yeah. They're very unlikely to buy it back. If it's a good business, it's likely to not end up at a lower price again, then they'd have to buy back at a higher price. Now, it could be a lower multiple or something, but there are very few people who will sell a stock at 30 and then a year or two later or whatever realize, oh, I should buy that stock at 40. Um, it really justifies it now at that price because they'll remember that they sold it at 30 and they're just unlikely to buy at that higher price. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on how everybody could sort of implement this for themselves? Is it literally kind of following the process that, that we use? where you just kind of have a you have your portfolio that you're mm -hmm. constantly ranking okay so let's say you have 10 stocks okay number one you like number one the best based on maybe it's cheapest and it has the best prospects and then really only sell when that number 10 stock um becomes less favorable than the first one on your watch list yeah i think that keeping that list like that is a good way of doing it i think the other thing to do really is uh, sort of like a pros and cons list. Not pros and cons in the sense of uh, they're equal that if there's three pros on one side and three cons, then, you know, the, then that evens out. But on the sense of crossing, uh, writing down everything that you have on one stock that you're selling and writing everything down on the one stock you're buying and comparing those things. So uh, I think that you want to be very careful about making sure that, for instance, you realize I'm switching out of a stock that maybe has less debt into a stock that has more debt, mm -hmm. you know, to realize that you're doing that. And that's 
okay if the other thing's offset it enough, but to be honest with yourself about what things you're changing and how that changes your portfolio, sort of thinking of your portfolio as if it's a combination, like you own a company that's a combination of all these things. When you switch from something with no debt to something that has some debt, you're basically raising the amount of debt in your overall portfolio by doing that, or you might be lowering the amount of quality, or you might be having a higher price on your portfolio by doing this, switching from something with cheap to something more expensive, but you've upgraded the quality. Yeah. You know? And to mm -hmm. just be honest about that and to list that, because I think it's hard to put it all together. What, what it usually happens to people, I think, is they come down to the idea of just their intrinsic value estimate and the stock price. So they say, like, um, I think that this is trading at 50% of intrinsic value, and uh, the thing I want to buy is trading at 20% of intrinsic value, so yeah. I should sell the 50 to buy the 20. But that puts a huge amount that works if you're very confident in your intrinsic value estimate for both companies, and that's hard to do. I found that um, I'm usually much better at judging the business's quality durability, things like that, much more so than judging a precise figure in terms of the discount intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. And I think also understanding that you're you're starting the undervalued process over again. Right, absolutely. You know, to, to really try to mitigate against the fact that you're selling a much more, I mean, if you invest the way that we do, it's not like we're mm -hmm. relocating to like Facebook or whatever like that. But I'm saying, you know, if you're going to sell a company that's a lot more, that you bought it when it was undervalued, overlooked, and now it's a lot more known and probably more fairly valued, and mm -hmm. you're, you know, redeploying that cash into an overlooked, undervalued stock, that you're just technically starting that process over again and to have that patience, I think. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I would also say that sometimes that's not going to be what happens. The first part of that, it's going to be that you sell a stock that you still think is overlooked. Yeah. I mean, it's okay to sell a stock that has not performed well yet for you. If the expected return on the stock you're switching into is a lot better. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do come up with a much better idea and it's just chance really when you find it. Unfortunately, a lot of times you'll find a stock and you'll say, oh, I should have, why didn't I know about this a year or two ago? It was attractive then, you know, but um, switching out of something that is flat or a small loss or something for you is fine too. Uh, it can be that you get out of something that's overlooked um, into something that's even uh, cheaper or something that's more attractive that way. And I think that's the hardest one for people to do actually. It's easier for them to sell the ones that have gone up a bit while they owned it and harder for them to sell something that they recently bought or that hasn't really performed, you know, it hasn't, the market hasn't really recognized it or something, but they know that they found something better. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's harder for people to do that? Uh, I think that they, they sort of do a mental accounting where they take the profit on what they sell. So if they buy something and it goes up and they sell it, they're not thinking in terms of the opportunity cost. Really all that matters is the opportunity cost. If you sell a stock that goes from, um, you know, 10 times earnings to 30 times earnings, you sell it. People are very comfortable with that. And that's fine because it works in both cases. 30 times earnings has a low uh, expected return in the future unless it's an amazing company. But I think that's not what makes it easy for most people is that it's really expensive. What makes it easy is that they have a really big gain in it mm -hmm. and they're happy to do that. I think when you have uh, a small loss on something that you thought was a good uh, stock to own, it's harder to say, okay, well, actually I found something that's even better. You know, I found something that I think will return 20% a year for the next 10 years rather than something that will return 10% a year and switch from it, you know, but especially switching into something that's just safer, uh, that you're more sure of things like that. I think that that that's a good thing to do. And yet many people won't switch out of something that they have a uh, flat or a loss in because it feels like you're admitting defeat on that sort mm -hmm. of thing, which is not true. Um, it really is just the opportunity cost. It's just you always want to position your portfolio as if if I didn't make any changes to this portfolio and I had to hold it all for the next 10 years, what's going to give me my best return? You know, It's not about booking those profits. It's about making sure that you're always set up in a way that, you're high, that your future return expectations are high. How do you deal with the psychological pitfalls that come with, though, after you sell stock? Like, do you ever, do you still follow all the companies that you sell? I don't always follow all the companies that I sell. Um, in some cases, though, I do because you might want to own them again. Uh, that makes perfect sense to own them again. Uh -huh. um, you know, I have written up stocks before I, uh, that I owned in the past and said that I think they're good. Um, so it will happen that if a business is really good, um, you may get multiple chances over your lifetime to, to buy them. Sometimes it's five or ten years later, yeah, mm -hmm. but it will happen again. Yeah, but like, how do you deal with the stock continuing to go up after you sell it? Do you just not even look at it, you know? Oh, that doesn't bother me, yeah. yeah. I mean, you could look at it, sure. And, and, but, I mean, in terms of, uh, like I said, a lot of that will be momentum and stuff. Once, yeah. it, once it's recognized, a lot of it will be P, multiple expansion, probably. Sometimes the business will perform really well, and you were just wrong. You sold something that would continue to perform well. Um, 
But yeah, I don't pay attention to that. No. Mm-hmm. And I guess, you know, sort of the main question that I would have, um, you know, is for people that let's say they're carrying losses in their portfolio. Right. Do you think a way to, I guess, get over um, mentally accounting is just to really understand that maybe they are holding it just because it, it is kind of like a, they don't want to admit defeat type of thing. Yes. Like, really, I mean, cause we've sold, we've sold positions before where, I don't know, we were down like what, maybe even like 10% or 5% or something mm-hmm. like that. Like it was virtually, but I feel like a lot of people be like, Oh, well I'm going to wait to gets back to break even yes. to, to uh, <laughs> doing it, you know, and That's again, insane. and again, right. So like, let's say this, we sold at negative 10% and mm-hmm. uh, we could, you know, I guess, toot our horn about that but mm-hmm. let's say the stock you know fell 30 percent for there right right we'd be like oh it was a great sell but let's say that it went up you know 10 or 15 percent so it maybe right. it's a bad sell but how do you just i guess sort of inoculate yourself from those sort of um biases that come with it because not a lot of people talk about selling it's all about like the buy part right. of everything you yeah. know but i feel like our sell decisions have a lot to do with the buy part process. Ours do, yes. You know, which is what you referenced earlier. Yeah, ours absolutely do. And I think most people would be better off being willing to sell at, at losses. Um, not because I think that's a good strategy to buy things and then sell when they after they've lost some money or because it matters. It's not because I'm saying that if the stock performs poorly. It depends on the kind of stock. It may make sense if you bought some asset player or something and it goes nowhere for a while, but it's still as cheap as ever, that you continue to hold it because you have to be patient with that sort of thing. But I would say that it really just comes down to your analysis of the two stocks. And if you're, you should, you absolutely have to be willing to take a loss on something because it does not matter that you have a loss. You need to forget the price you bought a stock at as soon as you buy it. You care about what the overall business quality, business prospects, the return you think you're going to get over five to 10 years, 10 years though, if it happens at five, even better. Yeah. No, and then just really try to take the price out as yeah, much as possible. Yeah, but I mean, I really have to stress this point because I think it's crazy, and everyone we talk to talks this way, and we talk this way sometimes, but everyone we talk to talks this way about how much they're up or down in a stock. It does not matter. Yeah. If you're down 30% of stock, no one will buy it for you, buy it from you at the price that you got it from originally. So it's gone. That price yeah. isn't happening And yet. I guess what I was going to ask earlier, and I didn't because I just didn't want to ask it, but it's <laughs> kind of like, like with NACO's volatility. Right, yeah so many people have reached out say, do you guys still feel the same way about the company? Yeah. And it's like, I mean, virtually, I mean, so they're spending more on CapEx next year, for mm-hmm. example, but everything, I mean, even when you answer the question, a lot of our analysis was on what we thought the company would look like in 2021, 2022, or even on 2020 right. guidance in general, you know? Yeah, no, I think people will be surprised that the, um, many times the stock that is most likely for us to sell many, many times the stock that's most on the edge, the most likely for us to sell has moved some of the least of any stock. Um, they assume that there's kind of two situations in which you would sell a stock. One is it's gone up a lot. And so they assume you want to sell that and buy more or something else. And two is that maybe it's gone down, but they feel like there's a big change. So a lot of people might feel like there's a big change in NACO. Now we actually don't feel like there's a big change in the business, but the price changed a lot. So they either react to that sort of drop or um, they react to the fact that something's up 50% or something, and so you might want to consider selling it. I mean, NACO is up like half or something from where we bought it originally, and then it came down. Mm-hmm. So the two things when people would talk about would be when it's up like 100% is when they might sell it. And then after it has that bad quarter, and it comes out with numbers that cause the stock to drop a lot, then people might want to sell it. Whereas in reality, if you look at what's often at the edge of our list to sell, it's often something that has been fairly flat, down a little, not up a little. You know, that stock is often the kind of thing that we would sell. And it's just because the stock was, it, it was always marginal. It was never the most attractive. Like the reason why we wouldn't sell NACO, that just so people know, is um, that it usually, we, we rank the stocks. And yeah. that very often it's been near the top, very, very close to the top of our list, even as its price has risen, in terms of things like safety of the expectation for the future. Normally what I'm looking at is something like, how sure am I that this will return at least 10% a year over the next 10 years? I tend to think that way more than like, do I think this will return 20% a year? Mm-hmm. It's like, how certain am I of like a fairly good return? Um, and NACO has tended for most of the time that we've owned it to always be compared to the other stocks we own at a fairly high certainty for an adequate return, mm-hmm. um, for like a market beating return. Yeah. It's tended to have that certainty higher than other businesses, than other stocks that we own. 
um, just for reasons like, you know, having a clean balance sheet and having long term contracts yeah. and yeah, 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 and things like that. And so uh, it, it hasn't moved around as much as people might think. Whereas the ones that do move around, there's stocks that we've bought that were always near the, the bottom of the list and mm -hmm. they never moved up really. Um, because their price declining by their price would have to decline by a lot to move them into a different position. It's not like a 10% difference in their price would mean that we suddenly like them uh, more than other stocks. It has mm -hmm. to be a pretty dramatic price change. Now, yeah. small price changes could matter if you were very, very sure of the value of the company. You know, so it may be that some people listening to this are very sure of the value of you know Costco or something, a very predictable sort of company. And then it might be that a twenty percent difference in the price really changes whether you would want to be, uh, you know, whether you would sell it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's for most companies that's not going to be the case. It's going to have to be pretty big swings in in price. Mm -hmm. um, and most times that people email me and stuff, they're talking about how much more or less I like a stock off of fairly low price differences. It's extremely rare for a 10 or 15% change in price to really move how I would order the stocks in terms of their attractiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think that's a good way to put it. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the two of us here today. Um, if you are interested in meeting up with us in New York, uh, maybe we're there right now, November 11th through the 15th, reach out to invest at focuscompounding.com. Jess will get you on our calendar. Again, that is invest at focusedcompounding.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up. If you like the work we're doing here, leave us a rating and review on the podcast side of things that goes a long way for us. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with us. We'll see you in the next podcast. Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and that was the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk about actionable stock ideas, investing concepts, and the overall way that we think about investing at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Go to focuscompounding.com and enter in your email to get a free watch list from Jeff every other week. And be sure to check out all of our other work where Jeff writes about stocks at focuscompounding.com. I upload how-to investing videos on YouTube, and we both manage capital for investors at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe to follow along.